we jump forward uh, five years. So we've been having quite a few Western usurpers, and there are a lot more of them. But uh, mm-hmm. I thought I would cover an interesting development in the usurpers of the late Roman Empire, in that my next usurper, who wouldn't necessarily go on a usual list, is Gainas. So Gainas mm. is a Goth, and he was in Roman service in the East. He was a general. So what had happened after Theodosius I had died was that his son Honorius took over in the West, and his other son Arcadius took over in the East. And they both had quite a powerful leader to manage affairs because his sons were quite young, quite inexperienced, and in the opinion of many, also not very good at their jobs. And so in the West, you had the Magister Militum Stilico, and in the East, you had a series of different strong men and also strong women with Arcadius's wife. And so Gainas is one of those strong men. He sort of comes to prominence by removing another strong man. So previously, you had a eunuch called Eutropius. Oh, yeah, I've heard of him. Made himself quite famous by being the one and only eunuch to have been elected consul, which was somewhat momentous and never happened again. And so in 399, Gainas was promoted to master of the soldiers in the emperor's presence, which was an important command because uh, the troops, uh, these were the troops that followed the emperor around. In the circumstances, there was a Gothic revolt in Anatolia, in a place called Phrygia. This was being blamed on Eutropius for not being able to deal with it. So what happened was that Gainas went to Arcadius and forced him to flee. And so Eutropius uh, ran into the church of St. Sophia, and quite famously the patriarch John Chrysostom delivered a sermon talking about uh, how awful Eutropius is with him carrying underneath the altar. Uh, (laughs) Gainas uh, basically forces a Eutropius out. First he's exiled to Cyprus, and then eventually, after prompting, Arcadius has him executed. Mm -hmm. And and so much for Eutropius. So then, having alleviated the emperor from the evil Eutropius, he expected uh, the consulship, and he also expected to get a Aryan church built in Constantinople. Oh yeah, because he was one of those German Aryans, right? The Goths have been converted to Aryan Christianity in their 370s. As I was saying, with Theodosius, he'd been very much promoting not just Christianity, but Nicene Christianity. And so Gainas wanted an Aryan church for him and his soldiers in Constantinople. But Arcadius... He may have not been the best emperor, but he was not a pushover either, and he rejected both of Gynast's requests. And so, in April 400, Gynas and his soldiers had a meeting with Arcadius, and Gynas made Arcadius exile quite a few of his ministers who were loyal to Arcadius, probably not Gynas's friends either, and mm-hmm. appoint different people. And this meeting is seen as Gainas basically taking effective control over Arcadius's government. Mm. So it's not so much a usurpation in the sense that Gainas proclaims himself emperor, but what he's doing is usurping power in the government. Yeah, and, he has the de facto power, right? Yeah, and trying to make himself a bit like Stilicho in that he is the emperor's uh, right-hand man. And in fact, in several of the sources, they label Gainas a tyrant, which is what really? usurpers are usually labelled as. It's so like, they'll go, the tyrant Eutropius, or, or <laughs> right. Eugenius. And also, uh, another source says how Gainas seized control of the Roman state, which does sound like some sort of usurpation. Um, yeah, of course. Gainas's regime lasts until July of that year, so three months. What happens is that an angry mob burn down a church which is full of goths and they start attacking and massacring 
Gainas's soldiers. So when he takes power, he has several thousand Gothic troops which occupy Constantinople, and that is how he's able to exert his power during this period. And also, you have a writer, Synesius of Cyrene, on his treatise to Arcadius. He's talking about how you shouldn't trust barbarians, you shouldn't let them run the government, and there's a strong inference that this is either written during or after Gainas's usurpation. So the mob is attacking the Goths, and then Arcadius, he orders another Gothic general of his, a guy called Fravita, who's the master of soldiers of the east, to destroy Gainas. So Gainas, with what his what troops he has left, he leaves Constantinople because of the mob, and he goes to try and meet Fravita's forces as they cross over the Sea of Marmara, and they go to Gallipoli, and there is a battle... And Fravita destroys Gainas's army. It's just, it's completely dispersed, and Gainas flees to the Huns over the Danube. But the king of the Huns is no fool. Instead of harboring Gainas, he cuts his head off and sends it to Arcadius. So, was the king of the Huns Attila or one of his? No, uh, this. Uh, oh, I can't remember off the top of my head, but Attila is uh, the 440. Mm. So some decades later, but the Huns have, have arrived. It's quite interesting in that so Fravita, for defeating the tyrant Gainas, he is rewarded with a consulship, which is ironic in a way. And uh, yeah. he's also given the freedom to practice his pagan religion. So, so even worse than an Aryan, he was a pagan. Also, in 402, Arcadius erects a triumphal column in Constantinople to celebrate the triumph over Gainas. You have this oh, sort yeah. of marrying up of publicising the uh, vanquishers of the tyrant and also physical reminders of the defeat of tyrants. So it's an interesting episode in that it's the only time a barbarian tries to take over the Roman government in a very overt show of force. It's amazing how only a few thousand barbarians can uh, control the empire by just occupying the capital city while, you know, there are hundreds of thousands of other army personnel elsewhere, right? Yeah. Well, as it turned out, uh, they weren't able to hold it for long. As soon as the mob turned against them, Gainas had to flee Constantinople with his troops, and then as soon as another Roman army came along, his Gothic troops were utterly destroyed. So. But yeah, it's an interesting episode. For sure. I think I'll... Start on my last usurper, okay. uh, who happens to be the last ever native Egyptian pharaoh of Egypt, Nictanabo II. His real name was Nakhtorheb, but that's a bit of a mouthful, so I'll just go with Nictanabo. He was the third pharaoh of the very last native Egyptian dynasty of Egypt, the 30th, and here's how he uh, came to the throne. His uncle was the, his predecessor. Uh, his uncle's name was Jedhor, but his Hellenized name in the classical sources is either Teos or Takos, which uh, I like calling him because, I don't know, it's just sort of absurd to me that uh, an ancient Egyptian pharaoh was named Takos. And now Takos was the founder of, no, he wasn't the founder of the dynasty, he was the son of the founder of the dynasty, a man named Nectanebo I. And he was co-regent with his father for three years prior to becoming the sole king in 361 BC or 360. And during that time, he was in charge of Egypt's foreign policy and helped finance the ongoing Great Satraps Revolt, in which several of the Western Anatolian satrapies of the Persian Empire rebelled against the, the aging great king Artaxerxes II. Now, taking advantage of this very revolt, when he became pharaoh, Takos launched a campaign into Persian-occupied Syria-Palestine. He was assisted by two prominent Greeks. First, a king of Sparta in his 80s, a man named Agesilaus II, who commanded a thousand Spartan hoplites and 10,000 other Greek mercenaries, and an Athenian general named Chabrias, 
who commanded the naval naval contingent of this campaign. And in order to fund this expedition, Takos had to increase taxes and even seized the property of the temples, which sort of reminds me of when Heraclius and Constantine the Eleventh had to expropriate the silver of the church in order to yeah. fund their armies. I've counted, and the number of times that happens are five that I can think of. There's Heraclius and Constantine, as you say. Michael the Seventh does it to defend against the revolts of Nikephorus Batanietes and Nikephorus Bryennius. And then Alexius I does it to fund his army against the Normans. And I can't remember when the fifth time was. I'll get back to you on that one, but it happened uh, very rarely. So it's pretty amazing that Tacos did this. <laughs> Tacos led the expedition in person, and his nephew, Nectanebo, led a contingent of the army called the Macamor, basically the native Egyptian contingent. And uh, Diodorus Siculus claims that there were 80,000 of them, which is... Almost certainly an exaggeration, as ancient sources tend to do, right? Of course. Uh, a guy named Chahampimu, which is a pretty bizarre name, right? Uh, who was the brother of Takos and the father of Nectanebo II, with the support of the clergy, who were really angry at Takos for taking all their stuff away, convinced his son, Nectanebo, to proclaim himself pharaoh as he was besieging cities in Syria. And Nectanebo II allied with Aegis Alaus, who claimed to be, who wanted to be the supreme commander of the, the expedition and was uh, really miffed that Takos took the job. Takos apparently fled to the court of the Persian king, and but apparently he was brought back in chains to Egypt by a physician who had taken part in the expedition named Wenefer, according to an inscription made by this guy. There are various accounts of this episode because Aegis Alaus uh, was a pretty prominent guy. Plutarch mentions him and his, he devotes one of his parallel lives, lives to yeah. him. Yeah, and uh, also Xenophon and Diodorus Siculus and Nepos cover Takos' fall. Here's how it is from uh, Aegis Alaus' uh, perspective. So he expected to be appointed commander of all the forces in this army, not just the mercenaries, and this vexed him. And Aegis Alaus apparently had to endure Takos' vain pretensions, which is what Plutarch calls them, until he found his opportunity, quote-unquote. This is when Nectanebo revolted. Aegis Alaus sent men to Sparta to denounce Takos and appraise Nectanebo, and so basically he was excusing his own treachery on the grounds that he was protecting uh, Sparta's interests. Right. Um, How convenient. Yeah, of course. Another rival, so Nectanebo is triumphant against Tacos, but he, who is of course a usurper, is immediately set back by another usurper. A guy rose up in the Delta city of Mendes and rallied apparently a hundred thousand men to his cause. This guy goes unnamed, but he was probably a scion of the 29th dynasty, which the 30th dynasty under uh, Nectanebo had ousted. Now, H. Slaus was tempted to go switch sides again to this guy from Mendes, but he was too ashamed to do it because... He had already done it once, so he just decided to stay with Nectanebo. And Nectanebo winds up getting holed up in a city in the Delta, because he's too afraid to confront the rebels face on. But he changes his mind while being besieged and becomes eager for battle, given that apparently this city had no provisions for him in it. But, strangely enough, Aegis, Aegis Alaus opposed him on this. But he did come up with a wise plan to break out, uh, to break out and won back Nectanebo's confidence and even his admiration. Once Nectanebo was secure on the throne, he begged Aegisalaus to stay with him for the winter. But since Aegisalaus was eager to get home, uh, Nectanebo just gave him a going away present of 230 talents of silver. But uh, Aegisalaus died on the return voyage to Sparta, unfortunately. One Egyptologist suggests that the expedition against Persia was only made possible through Nectanebo the first success at rekindling Egypt's nationalistic spark. Uh, 
and that was certainly a theme of the period, and that the Mendesian usurper thwarted the very last attempt by an Egyptian pharaoh to conquer the Near East. Nectanebo, once he was secure on the throne, was a prolific builder. More than a hundred sites throughout Egypt bear traces of his attention, and he constructed buildings at and restored and embellished virtually every temple in the country. Uh, famous examples include the first pylon at Karnak and the yeah. first phase of the famous Temple of Philae, which was greatly added to by the Ptolemies and even the Romans. This building program may very well have been enacted in order to help legitimate him, of course, since he had usurped his uncle, right? Everything wasn't all happy and dandy for all of his reign. In 350, Artaxerxes III personally led an invasion of Egypt, which, fortunately for Nectanebo, resulted in failure. Artaxerxes' show of vulnerability motivated the people under the Persians in the west of the empire to launch a united front against the Persians, a great revolt. Nectanebo II supported this, of course, since he was an enemy of the Persians, and sent, and sent 4,000 mercenaries to the city of Sidon in Levant to help them repel the Persians, but their leader, the Greek mercenary, wound up collaborating with the Persians, and over 40,000 people died when Artaxerxes III took Sidon. Really, a, a huge tragedy. And this same mentor of Rhodes helped lead the Persian invasion of Egypt in 343, which would wind up ousting Nectanebo. So in 343, mentor of Rhodes, at the head of this Persian army, is marching towards Egypt, but Nectanebo fortunately has 20,000 Greeks with him, 60,000 native Egyptians, and he even strengthened Egypt's eastern border with defensive installations. But the Persians managed to obtain intel on the details of Nectanebo's vacations from Greek veterans of their failed 350 campaign against Egypt, and they chose a time of year where the foundation of the Nile wouldn't be an issue for them, which it had been previously. They also had a unique strategy of conquering Egypt this time. They sowed dissension among the Greek and Egyptian contingents of the garrisons of various cities in the delta, and eventually, because of this, Nectanebo fled to Memphis. And eventually, he realized his cause was doomed and fled to the south, where he may have been helped by an, a guy named Kababash, then himself proclaimed himself pharaoh. It was, it, it, it's really confusing. Either way, in 342, Artaxerxes entered Memphis, and Egypt was now, after a brief period of revival, it was now back under the Persian boot. And Nectanebo may have ruled Upper Egypt, Southern Egypt, a couple of years before being granted uh, asylum by this guy, Kababash, in Lower Nubia. This guy, Kababash, would claim the throne, but he wasn't successful in ousting the Persians either. And uh, oddly enough, Nectanebo actually had a son who survived into the Ptolemaic period and who's attested by a broken statue who doesn't preserve his name, but he may have been the ancestor of various rebel pharaohs prior to his Egypt away from the Ptolemies, but they weren't successful either. And there are two other interesting facts about Nectanebo. He was the second pharaoh ever to mint his own coins after his uncle, who he usurped. He was probably the only pharaoh to mint coins to bear hieroglyphs, interestingly enough. There are a few examples of his coins. Even more interesting is the fact that a rumor started shortly after Alexander the Great was the son of a god at the Oracle of the Moon in Siwa Oasis, uh, claims that Nectanebo II actually fled to the court of Philip II of Macedon, not Nubia, and he did so in the guise of an Egyptian magician. He eventually seduced Olympias, the mother of Alexander the Great, into sleeping with him by telling her she with the god of moon, and then Nectanebo dressed up as the god of moon and had sex with her, and produced Alexander. Thus, according to the story, Nectanebo would be Alexander the Great's actual father, not Philip of Macedon. Uh, but also, according to the same story, Alexander threw Nectanebo into a hole, and this caused Nectanebo to die, but not before revealing that he was actually Alexander's father. It's this whole crazy story, uh, it's called the Alexander Romance. It can be found oh, online. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it's quite an interesting apocryphal account of Alexander's birth, eh? Yeah, so isn't the 
a story of Olympias saying that Zeus had seduced her as well. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone seems to be seducing this woman. Uh, maybe Philip married the wrong woman. It, it is interesting, sort of, the end of native Egypt and that. Yeah. Rather than sort of trying to organize a proper resistance, they're spending most of their time fighting each other. Um, yeah. Which gets unfortunately repeated in Roman Empire, and then yeah. later in the Eastern Roman Empire, when you have us, like in the 14th century, when they spend 50 years fighting each other in very petty civil wars and territory, they, their state is becoming weaker and weaker, and uh, the existential yeah. threat becomes stronger and stronger. In this, in this case, well, Persia was already very strong.